you probably you probably know her and thank you for press re recording thank you for pressing record um, dr Wynn is an associate professor uh, with the department of geriatric medicine at uh, john a burns school of medicine she is a program director of the geriatric medicine fellowship program and she serves as the medical director of manoa cottage and she is the president and founder of the medical doctors association since night um, since 19 <laughs> Since 2008, I was going to say 1908. Um, that would make you, I mean, that's awesome. She's a board certified geriatrics palliative care physician. Uh, she is also a consultant for Aloha Care Health Plan in the Division of Long Term Services and Supports. And she is currently a PI for the Geriatric Work Workforce Enhancement Program, which is WEP. Um, so she does a lot of things for our Kapuna and, and people that help uh, with the Kapuna and uh, making sure that we all have the tools that we need. Uh, so we're very, very blessed to have her. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Rick because he's gonna jump in right after Dr. Wynn. And Rick has been a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Washington for 30 years. He um, is a qualified mental health professional and a certified cognitive dis disability specialist. He is retired from mental health jobs and he remains active with uh, serving Kapuna and um, advocacy nonprofits. He's also a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association. So we have um, really, really great speakers that can really help with um, maybe some concerns that you have. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. We are gonna try to save our questions to the end and, but you can also put them in the chat. We'll try to get them. So with that, I'll go ahead and start sharing the screen so that Dr. Wynn, Dr. Wynn, does this have sound to it? No. Okay. So I'll go ahead and share the screen. You guys can see this, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, All okay. right, uh, you can take it away. All right, uh, next slide. We'll just get started with that. So yeah, so dementia, you know, is a neurodegenerative disorder. That means that the brain cells just slowly, slowly um, going away. But you know, it's not just memory problems, right? It involves the whole brain. So you may have problems with planning and judgment, or movement, language visual, spatial issues, and even emotions. And so it involves memory, but it involves a lot of other brain functions as well. Next slide. And, and therefore, because it involves a lot of, uh, next slide. Can you scroll it? I'm trying to. There we go. I have to push the little, okay, I figured okay. it out. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So, so because it involves so many brain functions, it causes problems with function. So folks have trouble with complex tasks, but they also have problems with everyday tasks. And, and that ultimately leads to frustration. Next slide. And what happens when you get frustrated? Yeah, you start yelling, you start getting mad or whatever, and you start having difficulty with behaviors and relationships. And you have lots of misunderstandings because nobody understands you and you don't even understand yourself, right? So it's really frustrating. Um, next slide. And a lot of people, um, this is what drives people craziest. This is the hardest thing to go through. Um, yeah, so you can see things like being aggressive or repetitively calling out, wanting to go home, abusive, screaming, accusing you of stealing, not wanting to get bathed. Anybody? I'm sure everybody has raised their hand. You've been through some of these. This is some of the hardest stuff. And that's what I imagine is why you're joining us today, right? Okay, next slide. So today we're just going to cover the basics of communication the ABCs of identifying needs and then planning for the prevention 
of these behaviors with the three P's. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. We'll begin with the basics. Next slide. Okay, so we'll start with a scenario, right? So it's dinner time. Dad is napping in front of the TV. The news is on. And you need to wake him up from his cat nap and get him to wash his hands before heading over to dinner. And you tell dad to go to the, go to the bathroom, you know, wash your hands, then come to dinner. What happens? Mm -hmm. Maybe he ignores you or maybe he yells at you and says, go away. But either way, this is not the response you want, right? Um, maybe you need to try a different approach. Right, so next slide. So the approach that you know I'm uh, talking about here is that we need to really begin by connecting, connecting with them. And so this is sort of taken from Tifa Snow. She has this approach called positive approach to care. I see Dorothy Colby's on it, so she could probably tell you more about that too. But yeah, so begin with the basics and connecting in three ways. You know, we don't want to surprise them but with anything because he was just sleeping. Goodness, what happens when you're sleeping and someone wakes you up, right? Please, right? So let's see. So, so start with connecting in three ways. One is visual. So come in front of them. Let them know you're coming, you know. Stop out at six feet and don't enter their personal space quite yet, you know. And then verbally say hi, introduce yourself. Hey, you know, this is this is Aida, this is your daughter, you know? And, and see if you can get permission to come in a little bit closer, yeah? Use their name, obviously, go slowly. It takes time to have things sink in and then come to their side. Don't be in front and confrontational and get low. Don't use your height as an intimidation um, strategy, right? Just even if you don't mean to, just kneel or sit down and talk to them at their eye level be friendly, say something nice, compliment them, you know, so nice you had a nice nap, you know, um, and then a gentle touch, right, touch them, and make that other third connection, so yeah, begin with the basics, um, next slide, and then after you connect with them, you know, then he might uh, listen to you, right, so let's try this, so, so doing something like this, get his attention, like not, Knock on the door, a light tap, nothing loud and banging, and call his name gently. Hey, Dad, it's me, it's your daughter. And wait, be patient, wait three seconds, 10 seconds, give some basic information. I think it's time for dinner, are you hungry? And give him some time to answer. Yeah, I think it smells good. You wanna see what it is? Come, let's go see what's for dinner. Then you walk with him to the bathroom. Oh, I need to wash my hands. Let's wash our hands. One step at a time. Let's do it together. Wash your hands. Okay, they go to the kitchen. Hey, let's see, oh, what's in the pot? Oh, looks like your favorite stuff. Let's get some spoons and forks together. You know, and then just one step, one step at a time. And if there's no response, just wait, silently count to 10, give them a lot of time, maybe try a different phrase and ask again. And of course, anytime they give you any positive strokes, yes, thank you, nod, smile, hug, anything positive will, be, will help go a long way. And with this approach, you might get somewhere a little bit better uh, than that. So that is, that's um, one strategy. It's just a basic communication strategy for folks with dementia. Next slide. And the second concept I wanted to introduce you to is your ABCs, right? So this is A is antecedent, B is behavior, C is consequences. So we want you to, after the some problematic behavior happens, we want you to stop and think about it and say, okay, what just happened? All right, let's analyze this so that we can think about how can we prevent the situation in the future, right? So when you're asking about the antecedent, what happened right before this behavior? Who, 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 what, when, where, how, yeah? Who was around? What were they doing? Where were they? What time of the day was it? You know, why? What's the possible trigger? Those kinds of things. And then think about what is the specific behavior? Is it a physical thing or is it just verbal? Um, 
and then think about the consequences and what could we change to change the consequence so that we want something that more positive than, than, than what, we, what we saw, right? And then the next concept I wanna introduce you to, next slide, is the three Ps, right? Planning with the three Ps. So let's say um, it's 3 p.m., right? And the kids are coming home from school. Dad usually gets really agitated when this happens, more days than not. And um, so, so what do you want to do? So, well, we don't want this behavior to happen every day, Monday through Friday from 3 to 3 p.m. So let's prepare. You know, what is it that might, oh, we can distract him with chocolate chip cookies and ice cream, you know, or some, what's his favorite dessert, your snack, or maybe have someone else available. So you, somebody else man the kids uh, and I will take care of dad, you know, or you can be plan the activity in advance is, you know what? Ah, it's 2.45, let me get dad in his bedroom and we're gonna watch the Three Stooges, something, right? And something that he might enjoy um, quietly on his own. And, and then of course, on what to do if he does escalate, you know, if he starts to get agitated, what are you gonna do? You have to be present with him. So, so as he's agitating there, you walk with him, you acknowledge his frustration. Yes, 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 it is so noisy. I cannot, yeah, kids, my goodness, right? And then while you're talking and listening and frustrating with him, lead him to a quiet area with his favorite snack and favorite activity and get him out of that situation and be present with him. So that's kind of the plan. So you gotta have a plan before, during and after, right? So if you analyze the situation, you can come out, come up with the three Ps. Okay, next slide. Now let's just stay, switch gears a little bit and think about needs. Has anybody ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? If you ever did school, right? And maybe psychology or something, they talked about, these are the basic human needs that regardless of age or development. So every human being has basic needs. Uh, but some, some of us can't express what we need, right? Um, so that, that's, that's, that's the essence of this uh, paradigm. Next slide. So, uh, so what this is, is that um, our dementia people have needs too, but they're not met. And so if we think about it, the framework is that behaviors is a communication of unmet needs. They can't find the words to tell us what they need and they don't have the coping capacity to handle that stress. Uh, next slide. And so what, what do we need to do? We need to put ourselves into their shoes when we think about the situation. So like when you're thinking about those ABCs and what's going on, consider their viewpoint. You know, thinking about the lighting and the shadows and the patterns and the sounds and the pace and everything that's going on in the environment, you know, and think about, oh, how might he be feeling about this, you know? And then you need to can interpret their needs. So it's kind of like mind reading. You know, how good are you at mind reading, right? Uh, when you know somebody really well, you can mind read a little bit better, but it is a little tricky and it's a little bit of a, um, you know, trial and error thing. But um, if you can f read their mind, you can adapt the solution, right? And do better planning with the three Ps. Next slide. So we're asking you, so in order to be a dementia caregiver, you have to be a detective. You have to look for unmet needs. And so the, here's that, that triangle. The bottom is the physical needs in the dark blue. Then there's safety needs in the light blue. Love, belonging, and respect is in the green and having a meaningful life is, is in the light green. So, so that's what we have to do. Think about the situation, put ourselves in their shoes and think about their needs in this order. So next slide. So let's think, this is here's a, you know, another common scenario, resisting personal care. So say John hasn't been the same since he slipped out of the chair two days ago. There were no obvious injuries and he was able to walk after that. However, since then he has been more irritable, refusing to get out of bed and pushing you away when you tried to help him. 
and he yells at you to leave him alone. What is his need? Could be a lot of stuff, but let's think. When did this happen? Mm, two days ago, right? Hmm, what happened two days ago? He had a big fall, yeah? And so, and also when you tried to get out of bed, so that means he wants to stay in bed. What might be going on? Maybe he's in pain and he's just not able to say it, right? He's pushing and yelling. He's pushing you away. He doesn't want to get out of bed. So what happens? Then he doesn't get the care he needs, but we can't really let that happen. So what's our plan? Maybe we'll try some Tylenol and see if that works. We, he doesn't know. He can't tell us. We'll just try it. Try some Tylenol in the morning. Move him one hour after the medication and then gently talk him through each motion. Okay, I'll do it gently. Okay, I know it might be hurting, but you know, let's try it this way. Here, I'll move your arm gently, something like that. So that's, for example, meeting those physical that physical need. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, oh, next slide. Going the other way. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay, a little bit like toddlers. Um, you know, they're also folks who have needs that they cannot express. And so sometimes, yeah, when you have a, a meltdown, right? And they, oh, you know what? They got their snack, man, I forgot their snack, right? I gotta get their snack. Maybe they're hungry, maybe they got pain. They're thirsty, cold, constipated, or just tired because they missed their nap, right? So those are kind of the basic needs that you have to anticipate and think about. And if you don't know, just try each one of them and sort of see. That's what happens when the baby cries, right? So is it that they're tired or is they hungry or they need a diaper change? It's one of those three. I'm going to try each one and sort of see which one of those basic needs need to be met. And after a while, you can recognize the cry. You can recognize the what they're displaying and maybe, you know, head it off a little bit. Next slide. Okay, here's another common scenario. Um, overstimulated and overwhelmed. So this is Tata. Tata's sister and family with the three kids have flown in to town to visit dad. You set up a very nice feast outside for the big family reunion. But during lunch, Tata becomes very grouchy, demanding to go back to his bedroom and refuse to come out again. Sister is upset, but dad waves them away. So what's going on? All right, maybe he doesn't like the gathering, right? He's too, it's, it all started when they arrived, right? And all the kids were in town and they all just, yeah, joined in the noise. So grouchy, refusing to join the gathering. And what happens? Then he misses out on connection with the family. And then the family, man, they, they, they flew all this way to see dad. This is just not going to work. So wait, you know, you got to hit the reboot. Say, okay, this didn't work. Let's try again. We can't not see dad, right? Let's have a different plan. So maybe he's just overwhelmed and just overstimulated. So let's prepare him before they come. So you, you know what? Yeah, sister's here. She came in. Here's some pictures of them. Do you remember them? Let's talk about some memories. Let's do some one-on-one -on -one visits. Maybe one at a time they can come and spend some quality time. Keep those visits short, you know? And maybe have it planned so that you know it's something he enjoys. You know, have a quiet area prepared. Reassure him that everything's okay. And, you know, have maybe have another familiar person in the room or something like that, right? So coming in prepared able and planned you know, you can do a reboot and have a better visit the next day, maybe. Yeah. Uh, next slide. And also that part of that, right? That's safe. That's safe environment. You know, so maximizing the sensory input, like being able to see clearly and hear clearly, um, knowing where things are and being oriented to place and time, labels and clocks. Um, when... Uh, the environment is a little safe. They sort of know what's going on. It's a little less frustrating, you know? So just that sometimes that little bit makes a big difference. Next slide. This is just another example of some calm environments that you could set up, you know? And maybe you have a little kind of a back room that is quiet and sanctuary to go when things get kind of noisy and crazy. 
uh, if you do have that, or maybe it's outdoors, you have to get out of the noise and you gotta, there's a little corner outside maybe. Um, but yeah, a nice, calm, quiet, safe environment. Next slide. Okay, here's another scenario, repetitive calling out. So if a Nana is uh, watching the afternoon news, right? And there's got pandemic and wildfires and protests and wars, there's plenty of bad news out there, right? And then she starts banging on the table and calling out for you every five minutes. And when you ask her what she wants, she can't tell you. She just wants you to sit right next to her. And what do you think her need is? Maybe she's frightened, right? Maybe she doesn't, yeah. So maybe this isn't the activity that's very reassuring for her, right? So maybe, um, Plan a different activity, maybe some gentle sensory stimulation. Stop that TV. That TV doesn't have good news on. Address your feelings and provide reassurance. So yeah, no, you know what? It's okay. They put the fires out and everybody's safe. So don't worry about that. And you know, the pandemic, the doctors, they all have the treatments now. So it's okay. You know, don't worry about it. And then yeah, the war thing. Yeah, well, you know, they're winning maybe, but they're working on it. They're, they're really brave and they're good. And, you know, we're sending a lot of help. Don't worry about it. And then just turn off the TV. Um, address the feelings and then provide reassurance. And next slide. Okay, so, whoops, going backwards. <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit about gentle sensory stimulation. Um, yeah, so gentle sensory stimulation is also uh, a nice alternative to nothing going on in the environment, right? So if you say, oh, it doesn't need peace and quiet, but you know, that's kind of boring too. So if you can do um, very gentle stuff, like listening to music, quiet music, you know, watching the fish or, um, you know, um, touching of very soft objects, um, tasting of lollipops or juice or, you know, something like that. And, and of course, maybe a gentle touch or a massage or something like that. So these are the five senses. And if you could just do something not overwhelming, but gentle with that, then um, this is, um, people will be less bored, more happy, content. They enjoy it a little bit. Uh, something that um, folks uh, can tolerate. Next slide. Of course, everybody's different, and so you have to adapt it. This is just an example of this uh, sensory stimulation strategy. This is a uh, Joyce Samar did this, uh, uh, created this Namaste care concept where basically, you know, um, it's a very safe and quiet environment, has soothing sounds. It's got a TV video with like fish koi swimming around or something like that. There's a people, somebody's going in doing gentle touch and gen gentle sensory stimulation. And it really just, everybody just chills out and gets really comfortable. It goes a long way. Um, next slide. So this is just a description of that namaste care, right? So you have that comfortable lounge chair, lots of pillows, lots of blankets, extra cushioning, a lot of attention care given to personal care, like washing face, brushing the hair. You can brush hair for an hour, you know? It doesn't, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's an activity, you know, doing individual reminiscence, lots of foot washing or lotion, range of motion, very high touch kind of a thing, but very, very gentle. And, you know, if you teach families how to do this, they can do this anytime. And it's, uh, it can be very effective because uh, oftentimes people don't know what to do with somebody with dementia. They say, well, they can't do anything. What's their activity? Right, so when they're with advanced dementia, these are very, very gentle things uh, you can do that can decrease agitation. Uh, next slide. So this is just more examples of uh, the uh, namaste care with the gentle range of motion and ADL care. Um, next slide. Like who doesn't like a nice foot massage, right? Right, there's some good soft gentle touch. You can have stuffed animals, um, you can watch nature videos, do some very gentle, doesn't have to be with some professional massage, right? Just a gentle touch. Next slide. Uh, Snoozlin is actually a uh, 
was it Swedish, Norwegian, something or other, uh, multi-sensory environment. You can see there's, there's fiber optic cables with colors and squishy toys and things to touch and feel. Those are those gentle sensory stimulation things that folks with more advanced dementia would enjoy. Um, that's not overwhelming. Next slide. And then I just want to uh, make a note about music therapy. Um, so music therapy has the most evidence for effectiveness and music therapy is basically music that you interact with. Um, and if you do it like at least two or three times a week, half an hour each session or whatever, um, you know, and then interact with it. So uh, listen to the music with them, join with them, tap the rhythm with them, sing or dance or do something and interact. It has been shown to decrease behaviors, depressions and anxiety symptoms. And so music is very therapeutic. And uh, yeah, um, next slide. Okay, here's another common scenario. And this is in the category of love, belonging and respect. Okay, so dad moved into your house two weeks ago. He has been restless every evening around 4 p.m. He's trying to leave the house. And when you tell him this is his new home, mom has died and the house is sold. And he gets mad at you and says, you know nothing. And he insists that this is not his home. So what does he need? He needs to be a place where he feels his home, right? He doesn't feel like he belongs. So we should plan this, right? Bring familiar objects, plan familiar activities that he did at home. Talk about the good old days, right? And maybe that's gonna help him feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, yeah, so those are just some ideas there. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so there's a big need for love, belonging, and respect. Um, I think you have figured out by now that arguing and forcing makes things worse, doesn't solve anything, and nagging doesn't do anything, um, right? Saying, I told you, don't you remember, right? That None of that works. And all it does is it breaks their heart. That's all it does. It's just heartbroken. So what we need, what they need is we always need to treat them with honor and respect and listen to their feelings. So that's kind of that concept of not listening to their words, but listen to their feelings and getting your uh, uh, antenna to be in tune with uh, that. Uh, next slide. This brings me to um, uh, uh, David Troxel and Virginia Bell. They wrote this book called The Best Friends Approach. And I think it works wonders. I mean, how would you treat your best friends, right? How do you like best friends to treat you, right? That's, that's right. What do best friends do, right? They validate your feelings. They don't criticize you. Um, reassure, listen. Best friends show affection. They ask for permission. They don't just do stuff to you, right? They encourage you, give compliments. They help you save face, right? Next slide. And really, um, they enjoy each other. Best friends know each other. They reminisce. They do fun things together, like go out for ice cream, right? Enjoy simple things. And, you know, you tell funny stories and jokes, right? You celebrate special occasions. You laugh, right? And best friends, it's not about the task. Best friends don't make you clean up after yourself after you mess, right? Best friends want to be with you. They want to spend time being with you. It's like, oh man, I can't believe this happened. Let's clean it up together. Yeah. And then we can go off and do something more fun, right? Man, that happens to me too. Let's not. Yeah. All right. So safe face. Let's be together. It's not about the task. It's about the relationship. It's about us. It's about our friendship. Next slide. And Okay, so here's, here's the scenario, right? It's 6 p.m. Auntie finished dinner. She has food spills on her shirt. You tell Auntie she has a mess. She should probably have a bath. You tell her to head to the bathroom and you'll meet there, meet her there to help her. She's indignant and refuses. She says, I don't need a bath and I don't need your help. <laughs> so, what happened, right? 
I don't want to clean up. Why? Because she feels disrespected. I think, you know, this is embarrassing and you just disrespected me. So I don't care. And, and really, she doesn't even know what to do. Like, if she got to the bathroom, she could figure out how to sequence what to do and what to gather. I mean, that's, it's not, it's too complicated. So plan ahead, simple steps, one step at a time and safe face, figure out how to help her safe face. Next slide. Okay, so here's tricky question number one, right? Can you be best friends with somebody if the person doesn't recognize you? Can you do this for a parent you never got along with? Can you still be best friends? Well, you know, funny thing, right? A complete stranger who just met a person can become best friends in a very short time because they're actually different than they were when you knew them a long time ago. They're different people because they've lost a lot of stuff. So you can still try to become best friends. It's worth a try. Yeah, you don't have to be best friends. You just behave like you are one and you might see some magic happen. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I know I'm going through this a lot very quickly and I want you guys to think about your situations and put some challenging stuff in the chat box. Maybe we're all gonna brainstorm with you a little bit later, but I'm just gonna keep going on for now because we got a lot of stuff to cover. Okay, Gung Gung has been rolling his wheelchair up and down the hallway for hours at a time. He does this every day. Sometimes he tries to stand up and reach for something, which, you know, he almost falls all the time. He rummages through closets. He gets up or tries to walk or toilet himself on his own. And you're just exhausted because you cannot keep an eye on him for every waking minute. 24 seven, he's up, up, up again. He's up, he's at it. How many people know that one? This scenario, very common, right? What's his need? Maybe he needs some meaningful activities. He needs a meaningful life, right? So we have to think about, okay, what kind of activity would be a meaningful activity that he would enjoy and be satisfied with? And that is gonna require a lot of brainstorming. Okay, next slide. Um, so yeah, so need for a meaningful life. What is a meaningful activity? It's something that's valued by adults. So it's not a childlike activity, right? It's engaging. That means they're interested in it. Like if they love baseball, then you get baseball cards to look at, right? Um, and it has to be failure free. That means they're not going to sit there and get frustrated after a while because they can't do it, right? It's failure free. It's engaging. It's something they've done. They love passionate about, and it's person-centered. And then there's something idea called continuous programming, meaning, um, yeah, don't leave them alone for two hours. I and mean, would you leave a toddler alone for two hours to try to figure out what to do? No, they'll probably go find something to do that's troublemaking, right? So yeah, you have to have something um, in the back of your mind to pull out of your back pocket. You have to have something continuously um, Planned. You have to have a, what's called a, a, a bag of tricks, right? Next slide. So what are some meaningful activities or like work activities like gardening, right? Or peeling vegetables. Peeling garlic is really helpful because then it helps you with dinner later on, right? <laughs> Chopping, washing vegetables. You can actually wash vegetables for a very long time, right? Um, Laundry, folding laundry, woodwork, fundraising, all kinds of things. Um, that's meaningful work activities. Next slide. Self-care is meaningful, right? Doing your little exercise routine every morning, right? For most independence. Um, getting your hair done is a very meaningful activity that makes you feel really good afterwards, right? Uh, next, uh, then there's leisure activities like flower arranging, right? Flower arranging, you can never fail because flowers always look perfect, always look beautiful, no matter how you arrange them. Um, there's leisure activities, playing games, watching musicals, watching a movie. You can actually watch the same movie a lot of times. There's a, if you have a nice good set of favorite movies. 
um, that's enjoyable. Next slide. And then of course there's leisure activities and games like some people like, you know, all kinds of slot machines even, you know, you can find anything online. Yeah. Yeah, so next slide. Okay, and then there's relaxing activities. They don't actually have to take a nap, but they are in a rocking chair. Well, actually rocking chairs aren't all that safe, but you know, something very comfortable, petting a dog, watching fish, watching birds or feeding birds outside. Those are fun, right? Those are relaxing. Next slide. And then reminiscing, right? You have tons of photos you've taken over the years. You can go ahead one by one every day at 10 o'clock. You can do this activity, right? And that's part of your daily routine. After breakfast, after the newspaper, we do some reminiscing, right? Something like that. Next slide. Music therapy is awesome and you can add all kinds of things to it. You can do instruments or tapping or moving or dancing. You can do exercise with music. You can do reminiscence. You can have live music, all kinds. Next slide. Of course, you can find something to celebrate all year round. There's birthdays and holidays. Every single month, there's something. And then if you haven't noticed, there's like National Chocolate Day, National Donut Day, National Cookie Day, National Pancake Day. I, they, they, I don't know. They come up with all kinds of things. So you can make another national day with it uh, and celebrate it. Uh, next slide. And, and I think that I, I really like this um, concept, creating moments of joy, um, where, you know, if you know that a person with dementia lives in the present, they live from moment to moment, they don't live in, you know, they forgot exactly what happened this morning or what happened yesterday, and they don't, can't really plan for the future, so they live now, so Focus your energies on creating moments of joy. If this is the moment we have together, we're going to laugh and we're going to make this a really good, joyful interaction. So create those moments of joy. And then, of course, yeah, like I said, you have to have a bag of tricks because you never know what's going to come up and there's something new you might have to try. And, you know, people change too. As the dementia progresses, um, they change and their needs change and the activities have to change with them. So you have to think about your bag of tricks and actually ask. I know you guys are with the uh, Alzheimer's Association. They have support groups and everything. And you can ask other people, what have you tried in your bag of tricks? Let's share. Let's share these tricks. Okay, next slide. And of course, one size does not fit all. And you know, needs and abilities, they change at different stages, even in the same person. And we need to adapt all the time. You have to be very flexible. Next slide. And you know, final thought for caregivers. Next slide. Is is really you need a team. You got to put your dementia team together. It's a team sport. You got to create a safe pod of caregivers that you trust, right? And you know, let's talk about who covers Monday, who covers Tuesday. What about mornings? What about afternoons? Who does weekends? Who does doctor's appointments? Who does the bills? You know and build in personal time, you know, join a support group, monitor yourself for caregiver burnout. Um, you try to be everything and do everything because you're the only one they want anyway, right? They don't want the caregiver, they want you. Oh dear, right? But you need your sanity. So put your team together. And next slide. And then, you know, put a, a plan together. Like I said, like if you have, um, kind of like toddlers, yeah, if you have, um, a schedule, they tend to do better if the schedule's the same every day, right? And after breakfast, after washing and brushing, getting dressed and eating breakfast, then we do the newspaper and then we reminisce and then we have quiet time, then we do chores together, then we take a walk and then it's lunchtime, you know? And if you have to step out at some point because you have a doctor's appointment in the morning, and you get your friend to come in, they can do exactly what you were doing in that sequence because they know what the plan is uh, and it's a little bit familiar to them. So it will help you a little bit. Um, it will allow others to help you. Um, uh, next slide. And of course, beware of caregiver burnout. Um, think about doing like a 
uh, caregiver screen to make sure that uh, you're you're doing okay or if you need help right so because caregiving has an impact on your financial situation your family your health increased risks of uh, health problems from stress and from depression um, high risk for depression anxiety and of course um, this increased risk for elder abuse or neglect not that you mean to it's just really hard and you need to get away sometimes okay next slide and then of course consider joining a support group and i'm sure tanya is going to talk a lot about that later on so here's a big summary next slide oh okay the summary is um uh connect in three ways visual verbal and touch um find the unmet need anticipate and prevent them, create a nice environment that's safe, learn how to be best friends, address their feelings, create moments of joy, including special activities and music, and then build your team and have a plan. And um, of course, plan with the three Ps by preparing, pre pre preventing, and, and being present. So that's the end of my whirlwind tour of the approach to dementia. And now I'm gonna hand it over and let's see if anybody has any questions or if- uh, One question on there. So my auntie is, uh, Elsie's asking in her eighties with dementia, she does try to talk, but no longer can articulate. I have a difficult time understanding her and catch on to a word or two. She says the incorrect words. My cousin says that's, uh, that happens with uh, uh, strokes and dementias and falls. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the best way to communicate with her? So if, well, you, if somebody can, they can write it out maybe if they can mm -hmm. or signals. I think, yeah, I think it, it kind of depends on where, where the problem is. Um, there's something called aphasia in medical terminology and aphasia, there's expressive aphasia where they have trouble they, they understand everything you're saying, but they can't express it. Um, so it's expressive aphasia, or maybe they they can, but they don't, their, their mouth can't, it's garbled and the, the, the speech is slurred because of a stroke or something and writing it out is better than trying to speak it out, right? Um, or it has to do with the brain not being able to, um, to uh, form those thoughts together. And then there's um, receptive aphasia where they can't actually understand anything you're saying. So I guess it kind of depends on what the approach is, but you know, I mean, what do you do with um, children who are pre-verbal, right? You, right? you you speak to them as if, you speak respectfully to them as if they understand you, right? But maybe also provide a lot of cues, you know, visual, verbal, you know, pantomime, um, things like that, flashcards, great idea, simple response, you know, point to a picture, uh, maybe that. Um, um, but most important is, is that um, you show that you're respectful and you're nodding and you're smiling and you understand what they're trying to, the general concept. And you can even say, oh, I wish I knew what you were trying to say. Like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. Here, try this. You know, and if they know that you're just caring, then that's it. And there's another concept that I, I come up with over the years. It's called, you have to learn how to speak dementia. I can't exactly pinpoint how to speak dementia, but some people are really good at it. And okay. they can do a lot of good mind reading. And um, yeah. Yeah, everybody has a language. The trick is it's kind of trial and error. You just have to find what that language is. I know with autistic, I work with autism and we do storyboarding. It's a whole nother story, but we actually put the pictures in. Um, Dr. Wong here, he had developed something where he actually put people's pictures in or things, mm -hmm. things that people relate to that they're actually in their lives and they can point to that. So there's a number of ways, but it is trial and error. Um, so um, I think you answered the other question that somebody had, and that was about if... Uh, Somebody is a mess, how do you help them clean up? And I think you kind of covered that pretty well. So, so what we're gonna do next is, um, if there aren't any other questions for Dr. Wynn, and we could do questions at the end also, um, have an interesting um, add-on to this presentation where we're actually gonna do scenarios 
and talk about ways to kind of manage the situation. So understanding and responding to dementia related behavior. So objectives of this will be to identify triggers for behaviors associated with dementia, explain the process for assessing and identifying challenging behaviors, and list strategies to address common dementia related behaviors. Um, one thing that comes to mind as a mental health clinician, so I've actually been in the field for 46 years. They didn't even have the licensing process until 30 years ago. Um, and I work a lot with um, cognitive disabilities through the years. And so dementia certainly being part of it, but also developmental disabilities. Um, one thing that I've found just, just personally and working with folk, my mother has dementia, by the way. And so one thing I've found is unlike children, we're going the opposite direction. The mind is actually kind of shutting down. So rather, so not saying that a person can't learn things. It's just that we need to have, um, as, as caregivers, as, as a loving family member, um, our expectations need to kind of shift a little bit to be more realistic. And so that's kind of what we're going to kind of do here as we go through this, a little bit what Dr. Wynn was kind of saying as well. So having a plan. So again, as a mental health clinician, I've worked with some pretty tough cases. Having, having a plan is everything. So we'd have to have a crisis plan for everybody. We'd have to have a treatment plan for everybody. When you're helping someone with dementia, you, you need to have a plan. You need to know them and have a plan for them as well. But you also, what's really important, and Dr. Wen referred to this, you need to care for yourself as well. Here's a startling statistic. I've done a lot of, um, an Alzheimer's Association know this, caregiver self-care. 30% or higher of caregivers actually pass away before the person they're caring for. And a lot of that is due to they're not taking care of themselves. We get in there like workaholic, like 24 seven, nobody else can do this but me, you know, kind of thing. Now I worked with the in-home agency for four years as operation manager. And I just saw remarkable changes when we would actually come in for even just four hours every other day um, to give that caregiver some relief. They could actually go shopping or they could go to church or they could go out to coffee with their friends. Just change it up so that you're caring for yourself. That's all very important. So what happens with someone with dementia is there's triggers. Dr. Wynn referred to some of these. So behavioral changes have many triggers. Could be, like she said, pain or discomfort. Could be overstimulation or boredom. Could be fear or frustration. Could be unfamiliar surroundings or complicated tasks, things that are too complicated. And they may well be tasks that they used to be able to do. So I've seen at the early onset of dementia, as, as a person suddenly struggles to do something that they used to do, that frustration kind of triggers because they know they used to be able to do it. So when somebody's born with a disability, they know nothing different. I'm colorblind, I know nothing different. Don't even ask me what's going on on my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's purple because that's what it said when I ordered it. My wife says it is, and that's for Alzheimer's Association. I try to have all the colors for Alzheimer's Association in this shirt, by the way. Um, but I also was, I'm a veteran, so I was petty officer in charge of the mental health clinic over at Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station. When something traumatic happens there, everything changes, and we know what it was before, and it's hard to get back to what it was. We're doing that right now with this pandemic. We're two years into the pandemic. I've been on board meetings where we're talking about having to be in person and there's a number of people that don't want to be in person just yet. I just calmly said, things have changed. We need to accept both and we need to find a way to go forward in a way that everybody is, is a part of it. That's the same with dementia as well. Um, so dementia just kind of continues, right? We go from oftentimes mild to pretty severe. So that individual is going to change as well. Something else to keep in mind is family dynamics. You're going to have a lot of family. That you're, so your partner, your husband, your wife, when dementia starts, your relationship is going to change. But there's an, as a son or as a daughter. So I can tell you, my mother is very difficult to manage. Hope she doesn't see me say this. <laughs> recording. Um, but my brothers and my sister-in-law, they're in North Dakota. They have their hands full 
Um, I have to be very careful what I say to them because I don't want to trigger our dynamic and they're caring for her, but they are being triggered by their old childhood dynamics with her as well. And so recognizing that is important. That's another reason a little bit of respite is important. You need to take a breather. Okay, so let's go forward. So the first we need to do is detect and connect. And we'll go a little bit more into these each as we go along here. The next is to address physical needs first, and then address emotional needs, and then reassess and plan for the next time. Because as you go through uh, tense situations or incidents that come up that may well reoccur, um, we're all human. We're going to handle them as best that we can. And it's helpful to sit back later after things have calmed down and take a look and see what happened, what we did, what maybe we could do again in the future. So I always ask, when the same thing happens again, what could you do? So I don't say, what could you do differently? This is my mental health terminology here. I don't say, what would you do differently? Because you may have handled it perfectly. You might not do anything differently. Um, but you may have had some areas that would be helpful. Um, I did a presentation on Tuesday for my Rotary, and I decided to be creative and use uh, a link to my Dropbox. And I learned that you cannot do that. And so I had to do is progressive relaxation. So I had to calm myself down and then just lead them through the progressive relaxation verbally without that. I'm still frustrated with it. And I still need to do some research to see what happened. Well, that's true in a lot of things that we do in life. So we're not perfect. The other thing is when you get to the end of the day, no matter if it's a good day or a bad day, you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, we made it to the end of the day. Tomorrow's a new day, right? So give yourself permission to be human because that's what we are. We're not perfect. Okay, so for detect, join the person in his or her, their reality by trying to see the world uh, from his or her eyes. So you had, a, Dr. Wynn, you had a nice pair of shoes there. You know, we need to put ourselves in their shoes and try to think from them and try to walk within their shoes. Um, uh, understand the person's reality and context before interviewing, uh, intervening who, what, where, when, how. So Dr. Wynn covered a lot of that. What took place before and during um, the behavior took place. You might want to also think about there's, there's things like sundowners, you know, what time of day, is there a pattern going on? Is it right after they took the medication? Was it right before they took the medication? You know, lots of stuff. Did they just have a phone conversation with their daughter and maybe that triggered something, right? So just, just put yourself in their shoes and kind of just just walk through what went on before this actually happened. And then uh, regardless of the situation, I always say, unless it's a uh, harm to self or others, approach the person calmly and respectfully. And I gotta tell you, I, I'm a crisis worker <laughs> forever. I'm not a crisis junkie, but I've always been in situations where I've had to do crisis work. I, and my wife will tell you when stuff happens, even just in our life, I get calmer. The more, the more tense things get, the calmer I get, I try to bring it down. Um, I'm famous for walking a person out of a group situation while I'm having a conversation because they're locked in with me. So let's get them, remove them from the stimuli and let's figure out what we can do and get out in the open where I could take off if I have to. <laughs> uh, understanding and addressing behavior also is addressing physical needs. That's very important. So are there medical issues? So you want to get somebody medically screened. This is what we used to do. Our, our clients would end up in the emergency room and we would, not, we would not go down to assess them until they'd been medically cleared. Um, I um, we had somebody in our program, this is in Seattle at Seattle Mental Health. I worked there for 30 years. Uh, we had somebody that was the uh, nicest gal in the world. And all of a sudden for like six months out of her life, she was just acting out all over the place. She was stealing in stores. She was hitting people, stealing people's sodas, which is a common thing, but nothing that she would ever do. She, she finally, she passed away and they did an autopsy. It turned out she had a brain tumor, but we didn't know that. We've also had a number of folks that are nonverbal that have had teeth issues and it's acted out. Um, so you medically need to clear somebody to make sure. They're also not good reporters yet. So we need to be careful that we're observing. Are they hitting their face? That's what the person was doing. She had an abscess tooth, it turned out. Um, so just, just going through that process. Physical problems such as hunger, thirst, you know, somebody that's diabetic that maybe is having, you know, some issue, just needs a slice of orange, you know, just being aware of that. My dad had diabetes. That was a common thing we had to do for him. Make sure we always had something on hand, right? Plan ahead. 
lack of social interaction. So we've got a big issue with that that's happened during the pandemic. So folks have socially isolated and actually with Alzheimer's it's actually triggered even more Alzheimer's uh, dementia kind of issues. So it, it, even just a phone call, or if you have somebody could help them get out of Zoom so they can see your face was important. Now we're kind of coming out of it. So important to you know go see folks if you haven't seen them in a long time. Environmental triggers for discomfort. And I'll just uh, being aware of time here. Then, uh, and then next you way to address the emotional needs, very important. Focus on the person's feelings, not so much the facts. We need to calm the feelings first. So I always say, so I, I'm into a whole rational emotive therapy, ABCs, I won't do that here, but I know that is virtually impossible um, to solve a problem until you've got the feelings under control. It's, the feelings are always going, it, it's, it's just virtually impossible. So deal with the feelings, we'll wor worry about the facts later. Um, use your knowledge of the person's preferences to provide effective interventions. So again, knowing the person is important. And sometimes you're getting to know them as you're, you're with them, but most of you folks are dealing with your loved ones, so you know them quite well. Um, so those are tools. Redirect the energy into a more soothing activity. So Dr. Wynn talked about that a little bit too. Um, I've lately, uh, something I've said around social isolation um, to help folks is to have a, um, a jar, that's your happy jar. And you, you just as an activity, write down when things are going really well, write down as many things with your loved one as, as, as you can that make them happy. You know, I, I love watching Alice in Wonderland. I love uh, listening to, you know, Lawrence Welk or whatever. Uh, the music, by the way, I used to do music therapy for groups. I do the therapeutic dances. And uh, for ages 18 to 102, I would say, I mean, really, actually, I think we had somebody that was 95 years old. And what I learned research-wise, but also in the therapeutic music group is the music that you listen to in your 20s is the music when you're older that you're going to kind of get jazzed by. Um, I listen to music all the time, and some people do, so, so it works for everybody. But what I would do is when I would play a song in the music, the therapeutic music group, if everybody was up dancing all ages, that's what I would put in the dance. <laughs> So like Halloween, I would always play Thriller. Everybody would get, get jazzed to Thriller. When my father-in-law, when, um, when we were looking for a place for him to live, they were playing music from the 40s and he loved that. The swing was kind of, that was in his, that was in his wheelhouse. Um, so just knowing that. And then of course, there's a number of very soothing, calm musical uh, uh, options that we could play. Um, so new age music. Um, I do a relaxation thing and I like to use Stephen Help from Spectrum Suite. Um, and there's just a whole tons of stuff like that. So redirect the energy. I also say with that happy jar, if, if you do try that, add something every now and then so you've got some fresh things. If you draw something that's not practical to do at the moment, that's fine, draw something else. Um, you'll come up with something to do. Um, okay. Reassess and plan for the next times. So we just talked about that a little bit. Go back to detecting and connecting. Look at what was going on. Join with the person's reality. If you're problem solving with them or planning going forward, if cognitively they can handle that, that's really important to do, get their feedback as well. What, so when I said, you know, we need to do this now, you just went off. What, what do I need to, what would be a better way for me to, you know, approach that? What could I, what could have I said? Oh, you know, so boy, it's almost noon here. I think we're probably going to have to um, get busy cleaning up. Would that be a more, better way? You know, just, you know, what do you think? What would you like me to say? Um, how can you make the adjustments? And then, and then you try it. So what I always say is um, afterwards, sometimes people just tell you what you want to hear and it's not necessarily going to work. So you need to test it out. And then you need, okay, so I thought that was going to work, but it didn't work real well. What would be a, a better way to do it? So constantly be reassessing the plan for next time. Um, also with dementia, things are going to change. So you need to change along with that, yeah? So apply these to any behavior. So detect and connect, address the physical needs first, then address the emotional needs, reassess for the next plan, okay, for the next time. Um, all right, so we're going to take Anne here. And we're going to talk about anxiety or agitation. And Tanya is going to read a scenario for us. And then we'll talk about, so first off, agitation, the anxiety and agitation. Um, so that's going to come with, of course, restlessness, 
poor pacing, distress, over-reliance on a caregiver, worried about stuff, that kind of a thing. Um, and I would note that, um, one, you mentioned, Dr. Wynn, some of, all the bad news that's out there. So, so if somebody you know, is a news junkie and they're really trying to take everything in, there's a good chance they're going to be anxious right now. And after a couple of years of the pandemic, worried about catching it, maybe they've had it, maybe family members have it, you're worried about them, you're worried about yourself. So right now, I would say it's, it's very situational. Uh, it's very common for folks to be anxious right now. So tell us about uh, Anne, Tanya, and her anxiousness. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Good. All right. So Anne is a 75-year-old woman with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, she was pacing through her hallways in her house in the evenings and saying, I need to go, I need to go. She would stop, I'm sorry, she would not stop walking even for meals. Her family would give her sandwiches to eat while she was walking. Though she used a cane, she was getting blisters on her feet and had lost weight from not eating. Her family would ask Anne, to sit down, but as soon as she sat, she would immediately get up and start pacing again. Just a side note, Anne had worked 40 years as an, a nurse on the night shift and her edu, 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 education began every evening. Her shoes were worn and she appeared to be in pain as she walked. It's a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty, pretty serious stuff there. So the first thing we want to do is just break it down. I, I find these tools are helpful to break it down so for, for you to not get overwhelmed. Situation like that could be easy to get overwhelmed and trying to figure out what to do. So again, we have to stay calm, focused. So the first is detect and connect. So listen to the frustration and try to understand the feeling. Try to identify any triggers for the behavior by asking yourself who, what, where, when questions. So she's got a history of, um, she'd been a nurse. I bet she was on her feet quite a bit as, as a nurse. So that might be just kind of what she used to do. Um, she probably got a lot on her mind about what she needs to get done or something going on around all of that. Um, uh, check for, so this is happening maybe in the evening, check for sundowning. So difficulty in late afternoon or early evening. Talk to the doctor about what, how to maybe manage that or to, to, to handle that kind of a situation. So address physical needs first. So let's go there. Assess for pain, infection, maybe medication interaction, uh, very common, um, or other medical issues. Intervene as needed. So again, talk with the doctor. Medical medication kind of interactions is a real key thing that people miss because um, that's internal. You don't see that. Um, abrupt surges and agitation can result from, oh, that's another big one. Urinary tract infections is very common with behavioral kinds of changes. Um, so they occur frequently in older people, uh, more frequent in females than, than, than in men, but it can happen with men too. Um, so if the shifts occur suddenly, again, check with the doctor because there may be something medically going on. Now, I'm going to point out that not all doctors are, are good with, with our, our, uh, gerontology, so with our elders. So make sure you got a doctor that's familiar with it, that is really, and doctors are busy, so they don't have the time. So you want to make sure you come in with the questions that you need to ask, or maybe even send them ahead so the triage nurse can share them with the doctor, so you can get real focused on what needs to happen. Um, we had a number of people that would get discharged from the emergency room and turn out it would be medical. They just didn't have time to deal with it, especially in the emergency room. They're just really busy, right? So be sure the person gets enough exercise during the day. And that's, that's dependent on the person's abilities, what the exercise is. And I found you could actually break the exercise up in different times at different points in time with what they could tolerate. You or I, generally 30 minutes of exercise is, is recommended. Um, so some kind of movement um, is important, again, at their pace. Uh, so this can help discharge energy and help the person feel more tired at the end of the day. Uh, see if the person, if she's hungry, thirsty, uh, has there been a lack of social interaction? Maybe she needs to socialize more. Maybe you need to spend some time talking story, yeah? Uh, provide the person with healthy snacks or beverages. So they're giving her sandwiches while she's walking. Um, um, okay. So because constipation can trigger agitation, that's another issue. Make sure her diet includes plenty of fruit and fiber, 
fluids. I find that clear water is, is best um, and sufficient, again, sufficient exercise. So maybe something's going on there. Explore the area surrounding the person and try to see if, if, if there's see if anything, if there's anything there that might be triggering um, the behavior. So we had um, um, we had a, a crisis call once where a person was getting up too early in the morning for their house, and they were very disturbed about it. So we sent our our, our, our crisis team out there. It turned out there was construction next door, and they were pile driving. And that's what was waking them up. They didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was as simple as that. So look around. So surveillance is very important. Um, I, I just told my wife last night that because she walked right by me, I said, surveillance is 360 degrees, hon. <laughs> look around because there might be a, a, a real a trigger that's triggering something. Um, when you wake up in the, uh, in the middle of the night for no reason, oftentimes that noise happened. You just don't know it. Um, you find yourself wondering what's going on. Okay, so then we want to do the address the emotional needs. Um, again, knowledge that you understand. So acknowledge. So a person mostly just wants to be heard. So acknowledge that you understand that the person is feeling frustrated or upset. And then you want to and, and let them know that you want to help them be more comfortable. So again, listen, listen for what's going on, what they say. It's helpful to kind of repeat it back to them, paraphrase what they said so they understand that they heard you if they're verbal. Uh, check to see if something has happened to upset the person or trigger the feelings, uh, angry, anger, worry, frustration, loneliness, or distress. Again, what was happening just before the behavior happened? And if you notice the behavior is the same time of day, just really take a look at that time of day. That's also important to share with a doctor because it might mean that you might need to change like when you're, when you're administering meds might make, make all the difference in the world. Um, or, you know, something else is going on. Join the person physically, matching his or her pace or movement, volume, speech. Uh, keep your voice calm and reassuring. So you just walk with them. If they're not able to, if she's not able to sit and stop, just walk with her saying, okay, so what do you got to do now? What's, what's on your list here? Hey, so how about we try, hey, you know what? I got this happy jar here. Let's draw something from that and see if there's something we can do there. You know, or, or oh man, you know, it's, um, it's uh, Joni's birthday today. I was going to make a cake. Do you want to help me do that? I mean, try to redirect if you can. Uh, so let's see here. Let's go to the next one. Reassess and plan for the next time. Oh, can I chime in a little bit? Sorry. Oh, yeah, sure, Dr. Yeah. So um, we're also taught that pain can cause this called exiting behavior. And so yeah. if they have underlying pain, they're trying to run away from it uh, physically. And that might be so just try Tylenol or something like that and see if that changes anything. And of course, be on the lookout for what might be causing pain or other kinds of distress they're trying to exit from. That's all. Good, good point. You know, I yeah. bet the blisters on her feet are causing pain too. So like he, she needs some new shoes. <laughs> something more comfortable, right? Okay. So at the end again, reassess and plan for the next time. So did your new response help? Ask yourself, do you need to explore other potential causes and solutions? If so, what can you do differently? Assume that the person will feel anxious or agitated again in the future and make a plan for addressing the feelings. Be sure to include what to do when the situation escalates um, and what interventions are helpful. Okay, so that's the first one. Now the next one is confusion or suspicion. Um, so not recognizing familiar places or things, accusing other people of theft, infidelity, et cetera. Um, this one can be, so with our caregivers, sometimes they would be accused of stealing something. It was really just misplaced. Um, that can be really difficult for, for caregivers. So making sure they understand that that could happen. Um, so there's a vignette for this. So again, it's Anne. Anne's got a lot of issues. <laughs> Tanya, yeah. do you want to read Anne's vignette? Very 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 typical too for families that are on this journey so um and uh, when ann's family comes to visit and the in evening begins she becomes very suspicious that people are trying to get into her house and they are watching her through the big picture windows hmm. she becomes suspicious of her family has anybody ever had this happen to them for not making the people go away and she says that they're all in cahoots with each other. Okay. So this is a common scenario too. 
So for detect and connect. So I wonder if there's curtains and maybe we could just draw the blinds, right? Or um, change that scenery a little bit. Or maybe we move to the kitchen instead of the living room where the windows are and just shift that to see if that actually helps. So detect and connect, right? Um, I would also suggest maybe pop outside and see if anything's going on. Because, you know, and then, you know, have her see that you've done that, or maybe she could come with you. So my little puppy here, laying outside here, goes crazy every time somebody walks outside. And I've learned that she wants, she doesn't want to chase them away. She wants to go greet them and be petted. <laughs> right? So just, uh, just check it out to try to minimize the confusion. Um, address the physical needs. So, you know, medically there could be you know, there could be some kind of infection or pain going on, could be low blood sugar levels, could be delirium, um, could be a number of things. So checking that out, again, thinking about the pattern when it actually happens and see if there's anything significant to that. Um, if a person is being given pain medication, consult with his doctor right away for possible side effects. Um, assess for physical discomfort due to environment, overstimulation, fatigue, uh, modify the environment, um, so this says take down mirrors, upgrade lighting. So changing the lighting might make all the difference in the world too. Um, so just change the scenario, if you will. Um, respond with a brief, accurate explanation, but avoid arguing. So this is something else. You want to be very careful to not get pulled into power struggles over things. So it, it's, there's no problem with just agreeing with the person, even though you're shifting maybe what, what's, what's happening. But getting into a power struggle, uh, most folks are just going to dig in, and then, and then it's just all lost. So try not to personalize stuff. Just stay, stay realistic within it and stay practical. Um, offer corrections as gentle suggestions or answers. Um, you can maybe move on, you know, there might be time to do an activity like looking at photos or moving to something different. Uh, uh, and then address the emotional needs. Briefly let the person know that you understand that you're up there, they're upset. Let the person know that you'll take care of the situation. Repeat this message to the person um, until hopefully they can calm down. Like I said, you might step outside, come back in, let them know nothing going on out there. Seems just fine. So let's go on with dinner. Um, remember that you have entered the person's reality. Let them know that you are here to help them and you're on their side. Agree, validate, apologize as needed. For example, I'm sorry this is happening, mom. Let's see what we can do to fix it. Just let them know you're there to help. Um, so you're not, you're not in cahoots with anybody. You're really there to help them. Uh, try not to take, uh, take on their confusion. And again, don't take their behavior personally. Um, this is difficult when you are targeting accusations, but remember, um, it's the disease causing the accusation and it's not a reflection of the person's trust in you. So don't personalize. That's easier said than done, but I'm gonna, it's important to say and to keep in mind. Um, so then at the end, reassess, ask yourself, you know, if it was helpful, kind of go back over the scenario, what you could do differently, because chances are it's going to help again. It's going to happen again. It may not be this very scenario, but something along those lines could happen again. All right. All right. Oh, can I, can I chime in? Sorry. Please do. Yeah. So I want to actually take this time to address a question that uh, came through to me really? about if a dementia person has surgery, how will it change dementia? And the reason why I want to put it here is because uh, a little bit about delirium and psychosis. You touched a little bit about delirium. And I just want to say also that it's not uncommon that after surgery, something very traumatic like that and the use of anesthesia uh, can also do a number on the brain can, can make people have these types of um, psychosis, um, psychotic de um, kind of delusions or hallucinations and those kinds of things. And so just, just as Rick was saying, you gotta get a medical evaluation and make sure there's nothing else going on. And if it's just a matter of, you know what, sometimes you're just left with this delirium for a while that takes a long time to resolve. 
A person yeah. with underlying dementia may take months, may take like three months for this delirium to really go away. Right. Uh, sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it just takes a long time. And so you may need to consider medications for it. If it's distress, I mean, if it's just like hallucinations that don't hurt anybody, that's fine. But if it's actually causing them distress and they're really upset every day and it's really impacting the quality of life, it may be worth treating with medications um, uh, from the psych psychiatrist or the psych um, you know, physician um, just for a short term to try to get things over it. So yeah, I just point. want to mention that, that that is possible. Sometimes I treat them with super low doses for short periods of time. And they, I target the timing exactly because if their daytime is fine, but it's that sundowning period, I give them like a quarter of the dose, you know, around that three o'clock to head them off and maybe they'll be okay for the rest of the evening, you know? So it may come to that. But usually we try every other strategy, non-pharmacologic first. So with that, it's really important to have a team and work with the team. So your doctor is part of the team. I mean, it's just, it's very, very important. So addressing the physical issues. There's also some surgery that could, can, uh, the outcome could cause some depression. And my, my dad had depression after heart surgery. Um, and so we did an antidepressant, which seemed to help quite a bit. Um, I had a surgery and I had brain fog for three months. Uh, sequencing was, was very hard and I don't have dementia, but it, but it did happen to me. So I'm, I'm aware that, you know, things can shift with surgery. So that's a good question to ask. Appreciate that. Okay. Next one is aggression. And guess what? It's not him. It's Anne. <laughs> Aggressive behavior may be verbal or physical. It may occur suddenly for no apparent reason or may emerge following a trigger. So there's a vignette for this. So go ahead, Tanya, and share this, that with us. This is, this is a very uh, fruitful vignette. There's a lot going on here. Or Anne. <laughs> and her husband. <laughs> and her husband. Yes. So Anne's husband, Bill, is standing at the back of the room, leaning against the wall with his arms crossed, watching television. Anne walks by and tells him sharply, you aren't the boss here. Bill just ignores the comment and he continues to watch television. Anne comes closer and, he writes, and she raises her voice and she says, you can't tell me what to do. When Bill doesn't respond, Anne comes up to Bill and hits him on the arm with her bald fist. So prior to her dementia symptoms, Anne was quiet and calm and she would never have displayed these types of behaviors. But lately, her outbursts are becoming more frequent. She continues to come at Bill, where Bill just retreats to the bathroom, lock, locks himself in the bathroom to avoid conflict. And he doesn't have a cell phone with him. And this is just a note, since both have been avid hunters when they were younger, there are guns in the house, but Bill has removed all of the, the animation. So that's that one. Like I said, there's a lot to it. Yep. So detect and connect. So try to identify immediate trigger for the aggression. Did something frighten or alarm her? Um, this may or may not be a logical response, of course, but what was going on at that time? Um, now we've covered quite a bit of ground, could be any of the stuff we've already talked about. Um, yeah. So um, ask yourself who, what, when, where, uh, how questions to explore the situation. Gently say to the person, uh, gently say the person's name. So say Anne and let them know you're there. You understand the feeling. And you're there to help before attempting to intervene. So I don't know what's upsetting you, Anne, but let's just try to figure this out here. You're clearly upset about something. Again, apologies. The apologizing, even if you haven't done anything, it's, it's, it is a nice step in joining with the person. So apologize when it seems that uh, it would help calm the person. Uh, so 
geez, Anne, I'm really sorry for what's happened. Um, let's just try to figure this out together um, and reflect on the person's reality or whatever you think a trigger might be even. Uh, then next, we're going to address physical needs first. We're going to call Dr. Wynn. She's going to have the, the magic bullet. <laughs> oh, wrong word. <laughs> uh, rule out medical causes. Some people lash out when they're in pain, which is very true. I've seen a lot of that. Um, so, so some people's pain becomes, you know, inflicted on you. That's their communication for that. that something, something is going on for them and they can't quite communicate it any other way. Limit or remove any distractions. Screen the environment for obvious triggers such as excessive noise, changes to the usual schedule, something could be medication again, like I said, something the person may have perceived as a threat, safely make the needed adjustments. And then address the emotional needs. Oh, when in doubt, check with the doctor. See, Dr. Wynn, I told you we'd be calling you. Uh, be sure to protect everyone involved so no one gets hurt. You wanted those guns, you want to remove those guns. They need to be in a place that, that they have no access. And as a mental health clinician, I, I did a lot with suicide kind of issues. Sharpies need to be locked up and not accessible. Do not, if you're doing dishes, leave the knives in the dish tray drying. Dry those things immediately and put them away if you have somebody and lock them up if you have somebody that's aggressive. I worked in a group home once and that's what happened. Somebody got upset, they got into a power struggle with one of the staff. Next thing you know, he's got a knife in his hand. Next thing you know, I have to wrestle the person down, sprained his wrist. It was a very dangerous situation. Um, so I've learned, I've learned firsthand, get that stuff. We had no idea he was going to go off like that, but we no longer had knives um, sitting out. Uh, we would dry them right away and we'd put them away. Um, so address the emotional needs, screen for emotional triggers. People act aggressively when they perceive danger or are scared, surprised, alarmed, or in pain, like I said. Some triggers may not be directly clear to you. It could just be really out of the blue and it's hard to detect what's going on. Adjust the environment to avoid a situation that could cause emotional distress. Um, this means asking uh, someone to leave the room while the person calms down and maybe somebody's come over to visit and it's just as simple as saying, Jack, I think now maybe not, not a good time. Let's just try this again later and have them leave, change the environment. Uh, reduce the volume on TV or radio. You know, a lot of, lot of our Kapuna, hard of hearing, so they got the volume super loud and somebody could be in there that that's just very annoying. Um, so just calm things down, bring everything down to a low hum, <laughs> ask family members, to speak one at a time. So it could be, uh, so Dr. Wynn had this live with a ton of people visiting for a holiday or something like that. That can trigger a lot of stuff for someone. And one-on-one -on -one is much better, or even have a room, a nice quiet room that one person can go in at a time, just change that. So it's, it's more, oh, and, and so maybe make an alternative plan. Like, uh, you know, maybe the person likes baths, you know, so maybe now's a good time to take a soothing bath, a bubble bath, something like that, if safe. <laughs> Focus on feelings, not facts. So there that is again. So getting factual with somebody that's in a crisis just triggers more <laughs> emotion for people. Um, I know for myself, if someone wants to break down stuff when, when, the, when the things are real tense, I, I, I've just watched the tension go higher. Now's not the time for that. You just wanna focus on the feelings and bring things down. Be positive and reassuring, make sure whoever you're working with understands you're there to help them. And then again, reassess. So some of the things, uh, once things settle down, um, like I said, make sure you get some of the weapons that could be potentially dangerous um, put away. That gun could actually be, uh, could clock you upside the head, even if it doesn't have a weapon, a, a bullet, you know, it still could be a weapon because it's a hard tool. Um, that kind of a thing. Make sure your neighbors are aware, you know, of, of the dementia. So when they hear yelling and screaming going on, they're not calling the police on you and triggering even more. We've had this happen so many times. So make sure folks in the neighborhood understand. Or if they see your mom, I know in the caregiving, we had somebody that was a wanderer, which we're going to do next. If they see your mom wandering, they know that that's an issue and they can help guide her back to the house, that kind of a thing. Um, if you have to call 911 because it's so dangerous, make sure they understand the situation that is dementia. 
So I come from mental health background. We actually did training with the, our first responders around mental health so that they would stop shooting our mental health folks and making the news, which is what was happening in Seattle. We had a number of those things go on. And uh, sometimes when I would be in the home, even as a mental health professional, as soon as the officers, the first responders would, would arrive back, this is 20 years ago, they would tell me to zip it and they're in charge and they would do all the wrong things. And we, we reversed it so that now they, they would rely on the mental health person to take the lead. They would even call the, uh, the mental health counselor to join them, meet them at the house safely to, to calm the situation down. So make sure the dispatcher understands the situation so they don't come blaring in with sirens and everything and trigger even more problems. So uh, I wanted to just say something about Bill. Um, he needs a support group. He needs to... Um, he needs some education on how to communicate. He needs a class like this, um, the way he was standing with his arms crossed and ignoring her. Um, that definitely was a trigger for her. Yeah. So he, he needs to understand. He just doesn't understand. I think he's just ignoring the situation and he's just thinking it to go away by like getting stuff in the bathroom. Right. So Tanya, you bring up a good point. So support, 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 support. If you, you do not, so it takes, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to help somebody with dementia for sure. So, um, and uh, you guys are here with Alzheimer's Association watching this. So I know you know all about Alzheimer's Association. We'll talk about that in just a second here. Um, I'm gonna actually just skip the next two and let's just go to that. Okay, Tanya? Sure. Yeah. For the sake of time, I think that's great. And wandering. So let me know. Let me, let me just tell you, though. So you really want to assess the situation that's going on and you want to measure what the what the level of, of, of emergency is as far as crisis. The last one I just clicked by is wandering. Wandering is an emergency. That's a that's a serious emergency. If somebody wanders and they take off outside of the house, there's a good chance they're going to get into trouble if you don't find them in, in, in a hurry. So that's an emergency. Uh, somebody repeating a story over and over and over, not so much, yeah? Um, it might be annoying for you, but that story, I, I tell myself with my mom when she repeats stories that, you know, I bet when she's gone, I'm going to reflect on those stories and I'm going to appreciate that I heard them, you know, so many times um, in, in, in various versions because it's going to bring me, you know, closer to her to hear that. It's very important um, that that repetition, it doesn't have to be annoying. And if a story has uh, a, a untruth in it, you don't have to correct that untruth. You know, that might be something that you check with your sister or your, or your auntie later. Did that really happen? <laughs> and they can fill you in on what did or didn't happen. And usually I find there's a grain of truth in there that has been elaborated into to quite a story. Um, watch too many movies, I think, <laughs> kind, kind of thing. But I don't have to correct my mom on that. That's, that's her. That's what she's, where she's at. Now, this last screen, I'm going to have Tanya talk about all these great resources that we have here. Go ahead, Tanya. Hi, okay. So, um, so you see there that is alls.org. So if, if you'd like to get online and kind of uh, comb through things that we have, we have, a, we have a lot of information. So the Alzheimer's Navigator is a really good tool to start with. If you're on the beginning of the journey of Alzheimer's, it's really neat because it gives you tips and it gives you the ideas to, to get a uh, caregiver, um, I'm sorry, to get a care team together. Um, and it just goes through things like, have you got legal and financial in order? Uh, are you, do you need more education on, um, on Alzheimer's or even how to deal with communication or dementia related um, problems like we're doing now? And but then we have the community resource finder, which is really cool because you can just basically put in your zip code. And if you're looking for maybe a, a assisted living, a foster home, a geriatrician, or um, if you're looking for even a class, um, you can, it will populate and show you where, where that is and it will give you information for that. And then All's Connected is, is really neat because it's kind of like a, a big chat room for people that are uh, a nationwide chat, chat chat room and it's just it connects people with other people if you don't ever have time for support groups and it's just a really cool thing because there's so many so many different resources that they have and um, then of course the Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiver Center which is uh, classes and things like that that we offer the safety 
Center that talks about um, driving and it's keeping safe and, the, and things in the house. Um, we have a lot of information on that. But this here is our 1-800 number, which is a 24-7 helpline, which is wonderful. They do care consults to their master's level, level counselors that can help you anytime. Uh, three o'clock in the morning, if it's a crisis, anytime, and they can uh, they can help you with information and referrals, anything that you need. Uh, so yeah, so there are support. We have support groups monthly here on Oahu and on Maui, uh, Hawaii Island, and Kauai. Um, we're not in person yet, so that's something that we're we're talking about. Um, so then, just to let you know that there are. Uh, you can go online and, and for training.alls.org and, and take classes and they're all free. So that's uh, that's that. And then we also have like the fundraisers too that we have, which is one coming up. It's called The Longest Day. It's a DIY type fundraiser. It's lots of fun. And then we have The Walk, which is um, coming up in November. And that's all I have. Uh, and we'll open it up to questions. So I'm going to click out of stop share. Are there any questions? Folks can unmute themselves and ask if they'd like to. And I'm going to stop recording just for confidentiality. Oh, good idea. Okay. okay. <clears throat>